Hello once again, friends, neighbors, and fellow Christians, and welcome back to our ministry here at What the Bible Says, as we are continuing in this series of lessons where we are studying the, the last day's kingdom that was foretold by Moses and all the prophets, that it would come in the last days, and how that this kingdom would be unlike any other kingdom that had ever existed, and it would be universal in, in scope, it would be uh, spiritual in nature, and it would be everlasting. It would never end like we see and have seen through history how that earthly kingdoms come and go and this this kingdom would not be left to other people as Nebuchadnezzar's dream uh, was revealed to him and interpreted by Daniel there in Daniel chapter 2 and so as we and, and again so I don't forget uh, I want again to thank our new subscribers and I sincerely appreciate you subscribing to our channel and helping us, helping us to grow uh, this channel. And if, and again, if you're the first time uh, viewer, first time uh, comer to uh, our channel, I pray that you'll hit the subscribe button and the little bell thingy down there, and that's technical words thingy. Uh, hit that little bell icon so that you'll be notified as we upload uh, new videos. And again, I pray that if the content uh, of our videos is uh, edifying to you and again that's that's my primary goal is edification in God's Word and if it is edifying to you and you appreciate the content I pray that you won't forget to hit the like button down there and to help the algorithms or to force the algorithms uh, on this particular platform uh, to share these videos out to more and more people and so if you've been with us for any amount of time then you know that we are studying the resurrection, which was one of the promises associated with the coming of the everlasting messianic kingdom in Israel's last days. Uh, again, we're not living in the last days. The Christian age has no end, Ephesians 3.21. And so the last days that we read about in the scriptures was the last days of the Mosaic Covenant, the last days of Israel. And so... We have, again, that's why I insist that we have to get the context. And so it was predicted, it was foretold by Moses and all the prophets, and we'll see a verse that says that in, shortly here, Lord willing, that, uh, that this resurrection would accompany, along with the judgment, and the second coming. But this, this would be the accompanying constituent elements of the kingdom, the messianic everlasting Kingdom, And so studying the resurrection from 1 Corinthians 15, we are studying through parallelism what Paul taught to the Romans. We're in Romans chapter 8. And so uh, we'll go down here and look at this. And so we, we've been looking at in chapter 8 here, Paul's use of this phrase after the flesh. And so we have seen, and again we've demonstrated this in previous lessons, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that at this point. But we just look at, for instance, verse 8, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So it's obvious he's not using in the flesh as referring to being physically, biologically alive. Because that would be foolish to say, well, because I'm physically alive, then I cannot please God. So it's obvious he's using that phrase, this phraseology, to refer to something else, which we have demonstrated as uh, life under the covenant of Moses. And it, it uh, entails as well as what Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3 that the, the, uh, the Jews, Israel, they were born of the seed lineage of Abraham. They were born, physically born into the kingdom. All right? And so that entails that as well. And so we have to understand that. And that's what Jesus was teaching the Sadducees that when this new covenant would come in fulfillment, that the kingdom, the spiritual kingdom, the everlasting kingdom, that people would not gain entrance into this spiritual kingdom through physical birth. And that's what Jesus was telling Nicodemus. And so again, this we have to understand these spiritual concepts, and we have to understand this pictorial, parabolic, type of language used by Hebrews. All right, so, and then he says, verse 9, but you are not in the flesh. Well, again, he's not writing to spirits. 
All right, so again, that demonstrates uh, that he's not using this phrase in the flesh as referring to being physically alive versus physically dead. Verse 10, if Christ is in you, the body is dead. And we've demonstrated that that's the body of sin that he talked about in chapter 6. It's parallel with the body that was being sown, the natural body that was being sown, 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ is in you, and he, in the previous chapter he said, you have become dead to the law by the body of Christ. So it's the same concepts. All right, so then in our verse, in verse 11, and we touched on a little bit of this in the last lesson. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Now, hang on, I'll raise that up a little higher on the screen there. All right, so verse 11. Now, if the Spirit of Him, okay, who is Him, Who's the pronoun him referring to who raised up Jesus from the dead? Well, obviously, that would be the Father. So this is, Paul is talking about the Father's Spirit. In other words, Holy Spirit, right? That seems simple enough to understand. And so this is what Peter was teaching on the day of Pentecost when he said, You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him, See, God did those things through him. In the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now notice, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Now, there's a whole, whole other lesson in verse 24 right there that we don't have time to develop. Maybe we'll save that for uh, the future. But God, that's the point, God raised him up and he, what, he has loosed, thrown down, luo, he has thrown down the throes, which infers a birth, birth pangs anyway, but the throes of death. And see, he was in Hades. So again, I, I'm throwing you all some bones there. There, there's a whole lot in that verse right there. And that it was not possible that he should be held by it. All right, but then Peter goes on and says in verse 32, this Jesus whom God raised up, see again, the Father raised him up. And they, the apostles, they were all witnesses to that fact. Now, this is interesting too, that when we come to Acts chapter 13, this is when Paul and Barnabas came to Antioch. And again, the, Paul's sermon here is an entire uh, study, an entire lesson within itself. And perhaps we'll do that sometime in the future as well. Because there is so much good stuff that Paul uh, presents here at the synagogue. And so he says, Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is this word of salvation sent. Now, and just kind of hang on to that right there. As we go on, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Well, who? Israel, the stock of Abraham. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets. Nor yet the voices of the prophets. Why did they crucify Jesus? Because they didn't know the voices of the prophets. You see that? Why is man today stuck in this futurist eschatology because he doesn't know the voices of the prophets. And he is unaware of the fact that the voices of the prophets, i.e. the Old Testament, is the foundation of the New Testament. And again, I know I'll keep reiterating that, but hopefully if I say it enough, it'll stick and you'll remember that. And you'll realize that Holy Spirit, what we have as the New Testament is Holy Spirit's Quotation, interpretation, and application of his own words spoken through the voices of the prophets. All right. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and the rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them, how? In condemning him. 
You see that the voices of the prophets foretold that the Jews would, would kill Jesus. And they merely fulfilled what the prophets said. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet they, uh, they desired Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, now notice that, and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, I had a fellow one time quoted this verse to another person and said that our position has Christ being crucified in AD 70. Now, he didn't explain anything about the text. He just made that assertion to throw sand in the eyes of whoever the person was who was wanting to ask me a question. And it's, it's a shame and a scandal that brethren would use such underhanded, deceitful tactics. When they had fulfilled all that was written, you see when you go back to Luke 18, 31 and following, Jesus told his disciples, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written in the prophets concerning me shall be accomplished. And then he enumerates, he elucidates everything that he's talking about. And then after his resurrection in Luke 24, he says, These are the words that I've spoken to you while I was yet with you. And he refers back to what's recorded in Luke 18, 31 and following. That all things that were written in the law and in the Psalms and in the prophets concerning him will be accomplished. And so these things were qualified. And so when Paul says this here, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about Christ's crucifixion because that's the context. They slew him because they didn't know the voices of the prophets. So when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. See that? And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, there's the, the gospel, folks, and we declare unto you glad tidings how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, did you catch that? Do you see that? We declare unto you glad tidings how that the promise that was made unto the fathers. What was the promise that was made unto the fathers? That God would raise them up a Savior, a prophet, like, as Moses is speaking, like unto me, whom you shall hear in all things. Right? But that is exactly what Paul says in the next chapter of our text here in Romans. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertains the adoption. And we have the adoption in verse 15 here of our text. And the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of law, and the service of God, and the promises. Whose are the fathers? You see that? These promises pertain to the fathers. And that's what he says here. Whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. And so that's what Paul is saying here in this sermon in Antioch. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again. Again, there's, there's our point. God raised him up. Paul says, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And Paul quotes that verse, that uh, prophecy again in his letter to the Hebrews there in chapter 1. And so, as we notice then, when Paul was before Agrippa, he said, And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God, unto our fathers. So again, there he's saying the same thing that he said in the sermon at Antioch and that he records in our text here in just a little bit later in chapter 9. He says, Now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come. 
for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. What's he talking about? Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? So he's talking about the resurrection. Now, the King James translators uh, blundered here. I don't know if it was intentional. I, I, I don't know. But there is no subjunctive verb in that verse. That is in the present tense. All right? So what Paul said was, why... Should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God is raising the dead ones? And it's necrosis, plural, dead ones. But that's what he said. And see, when you back up in Acts there, uh, back even to chapters 20 and 21, this is when, especially in 21, this is when the tumult was, was made. And then in 20, chapter 22 is when Paul... Uh, divides the crowd as it were they were sadducees and, and pharisees and he said you know i'm a pharisee and uh they also and we've read this they also allow that there is about to be a resurrection of the dead both of the just and the unjust and so at first they thought paul was was a really fine fella you know he agrees with us but then something changed and that is they they figured out that the nature of the resurrection was not what they perceived it to be. And so they disagreed with Paul, and they, they're they trying to kill him, and so he's had to appeal to Caesar. And so then Paul says here to Agrippa, well, why, why is this such an incredible thing with you that God is raising the dead? Present tense. And so he dropped down in uh, verse to, to verse 22 of this uh, discussion here before Agrippa, and he says, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say, and here's, again, should. There's no subjunctive here. This is mellow in the present tense, present active indicative. Moses did say, he is about to come. Paul said, it is about to come. Christ should suffer, that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and that he is about to show light unto the people and the Gentiles. Again, check that out. Get Check your interlinear. Go to BibleHub.com. Insert the verse there. Click on Greek and, and look at the tenses of the word, and you'll see that. You'll see I'm not just making something up, that I'm not changing the text other than correcting the mistakes of the translators here. Because, again, there's no subjunctive there. And even these words that he should suffer, that he should rise from the dead. The, those are adjectives. But the verb that he should show, that's a verb. He is about to show light unto the people. Check that out and study that. And so then uh, we see that Paul is teaching and preaching the same thing, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And you see it there on your screen. I'm not going to read it. I take time to read it. But again, this is, I just sometimes I marvel how people, they will take this passage and say, see there, baptism is not essential. It's just faith on it. Just believe in Christ. Just believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And when I point out that when Paul said there that you have received the gospel, that when we go back to Acts chapter 18, when they received the gospel, they heard, believed, and were baptized, and, and people just, they have a meltdown. They, they, it's, it's so foreign to the way they think that they, they just can't accept it, and it's, that's where you get the term cognitive dissonance. Uh, but that's context, folks. You cannot ignore what the Bible says. Paul preached the gospel at Corinth, Acts chapter 18. They heard, believed, and were baptized. And so when Paul writes to them and says, the gospel which you received, that's what they received. They heard, they heard the gospel, they believed it, and were baptized. So it, you, you can't argue that 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 uh, is salvation without baptism. That is a flawed, fatally flawed assertion. All right. Again, in Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, another text saying that, that God raised Christ from the dead. You see it there on your screen. Uh, again, we see the, the same sentiment in Hebrews 13 and verse 20. 
Uh, again, you see it on your screen there. And then we see that Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 21, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory. And remember, that's what Jesus prayed for in John 17. That he would be restored to the glory he had with the Father before his incarnation. And that's what Peter is saying has been accomplished. And that God raised him up from the dead and gave him glory. And imagine that. There's Peter preaching the same thing as Paul again. Just throw that out there for, uh, as another bone. And so as Paul says here then in our verse, verse 11, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Now again, let me let me reiterate. When we as we have demonstrated all of the previous context that Paul cannot be talking about physical bodies just because they are physically alive or uh Physically dead, that he, and he can't be talking about them being physically dead. Christ be in you, the body is dead. Again, obviously, he's not talking about physical, uh, physiology and anatomy and so forth. So, then there's no, there's no logical basis, there's no exegetical basis, there's no hermeneutical basis to all of a sudden, in verse 11, switch horses in the middle of the stream, so to speak. He cannot be using mortal bodies the way most people assume that he is using mortal bodies as referring to corpses that would come up out of tombs and graves and the sea and etc. But this is parallel with what he taught in Ephesians 2, 1 through 6. And you hath he quickened, and that's what he says here in a verse, right? He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So again, it's obvious they weren't physically dead. They were spiritually dead in trespasses and sin. All right? Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Who would that be, folks? That would be Israel after the flesh. Among whom we all had our conversation, manner of life, conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. So I see he said it twice. They were dead in sin. Hath quickened us together with Christ. Have been made alive. So when Paul says here, and again, remember, Paul taught the same thing everywhere in every church. 1 Corinthians 4.17. So when Paul says that he who raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies, plural. Notice what we see in Ephesians 2. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, that's resurrection, folks, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How, what, what better definition do you need of resurrection than those who were dead in sin, but they were made alive in Christ? That's resurrection, folks. Now, when we keep on reading then, go up, drop on down, and again, read in between what I'm skipping for time's sake. Wherefore, remember that you being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision. So that's Gentiles and Jews. You have the Jew-Gentile distinction here in the flesh made by hands. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in 
Christ Jesus, how'd they get into Christ? They were immersed into Christ, as we've just seen in Romans 6. These Ephesians were baptized in water, in the name of the Lord, by Paul. Acts 19, verses 1 through 5. And then he writes to them and says, but you are, uh, oh, that's 1 Corinthians, you're sanctified, you're cleansed. Uh, in Ephesians, he says that he has sanctified and cleansed the church with the washing of water by the word. Okay? So he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. What's he talking about? He's talking about that wall of partition that divided the court there, the temple, between the Jew and the Gentile. He has broken that down. That's, and he's using figurative language, but there was a physical structure erected there. And so he has broken down, he's removed the barrier between Jew and Gentile. That's simple. See, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that's the enmity between the Jew and the Gentile. Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Why? For to make in himself of twain, of the two. What's the two? The Jew and the Gentile. For to make in himself of the two, of Jew and Gentile, one new man. Now again, I know i said this in the past, but I'm going to keep saying it. When the text says that two were made into one new man, there had to be two men. That's inescapably logical. And that he might reconcile both, that's two, that's the Jew and the Gentile. That he might reconcile both unto God in one body. Again, same principle. If he's making two, the Jew and the Gentile, into one body, then there had to be two bodies. Again, that is inescapable logic. And it's, I mean, you, you, you can't get around that fact. And that's what he says here, that he, is, that he would reconcile both unto God in one body. They had been quickened and made alive. That's what Paul is saying here in our text, that he shall also quicken your mortal bodies. That's the body of the Jews and the body of the Gentiles to make one new body. That's Christ's body of which he is the head. That is the church. That is the kingdom. All right? And so, again, with the idea of mortal bodies, this is parallel, again, with uh, the corruptible and the body that was being sown in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verses 53 and 54 there in particular. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. See, that's being quickened and made alive. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory, quoting Isaiah 25 and verse 8, which is the resurrection. He'd wipe away all tears, the very next statement in that verse. He'd wipe away all tears uh, from their eyes. And Paul says that the resurrection would be the fulfillment of Isaiah 25, 8. And Jesus said that all things written, Isaiah 25, 8 was one of the things that was written, that all things that were written would be fulfilled during the generation that would see every stone of the temple thrown down. Now, folks, that's not my generation. I did not see every stone of the temple thrown down. My eyes did not see that. Nor will anybody ever see that because that was taken away the Roman soldiers dug up the foundation stones. They plowed the, and salted the ground. Okay? And again, Isaiah 25 verse 2 said that when this would take place, that the temple would never be rebuilt. So it is impossible. It is categorically impossible that this can be yet in our future. 
Paul said the resurrection would fulfill Isaiah 25, 8. And Isaiah 25, 8 is in the specific context of the destruction of the Jewish temple, which would never be rebuilt. There's no way around this, folks, when you will allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. All right, again, uh, they were not to let sin reign in their mortal body, as we've just seen in, in chapter 6 and verse 12. And we again, in thinking about the idea of, is this talking about physical bodies? Paul wrote to the Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 16, Know ye not that you are the temple of God? You are. That's present tense. That is the fulfillment of such passages as Ezekiel 37. You are, not you shall be, you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. You see that? And then he would reiterate the same idea in chapter 6 there, 1 Corinthians. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay, and, and we've covered, we covered James 2.26 in the previous lesson, so we're not going to uh, touch on that. Uh, this morning. Again, we've, we've dealt with that in the previous lesson. And so there's several more things here that I want to say in the next couple of verses here uh, before we get into uh, verse 14, where we will be debunking one of the number one typical objections that is raised against the position of all things fulfilled. Uh, and so I'm, I'm out of time this morning, so we'll pick up then, Lord willing, with uh, verse 12 in our next study uh, where he's talking about uh, we're debtors not to the flesh, which he's already said, and we'll, we'll demonstrate that as we go on and continue in this study here. And so uh, I hope that we have considered some things here that in uh, you reading these other texts, that I've shown you, again, remembering that Paul taught the same thing everywhere in every church, all right? And that through parallelism, what he taught here, he taught here, then when these things are harmonized, then it's, it's easy to see that Paul is not talking about physical, fleshly bodies dying and being corpses being resurrected at this mythological end of time. It's another thing, something that uh, is not stated in the Bible. And so um, we'll, uh, we'll stop here and then Lord willing continue with our thoughts here in this section of text in Romans 8 in our next study. Please, again, don't forget to hit the like button uh, to help uh, share the videos out to more folks and uh, share the videos yourself out to your friends and neighbors and relatives and let's just encourage people to study, like the Bereans, to study the Bible, to search the scriptures, to see whether or not the things you are hearing are true in context. Again, that's why they search the scriptures. If they just wanted to make something up, why, why, would, they, why would they search the scriptures? That's, that's getting at the context of the things Paul was teaching. And they would go back to the Old Testament and search the scriptures. Because that's the only scriptures they had to search. And they would search those things and look at the context of what those things said to see how Paul was applying those things to see if he was telling them the truth. And that's very noble, which is what he said. They were more noble than those of Thessalonica. Okay, so until our next lesson, I pray that God will bless you richly in your study of his word. And I pray that you have a blessed day.